Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preteris Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And we are, con this is video number 13 in my continuing review and reputation. Now, uh, my plan is that I'm not going to do over 20 uh, videos in response to, uh, to Mr. Pope's book. I don't think it's necessary. So uh, I think what I've said thus far is sufficient reputation. I haven't covered at all. I haven't covered, you know, he has a quite lengthy discussion, for instance, of Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, which is really strange to me, I must say to you. Uh, you know, anyone from the Churches of Christ all millennial perspective, that would appeal to Ezekiel 40 to 48. For any kind of a futurist eschatology is contradicting their own theology. Because fundamental to the amillennial world of the churches of Christ is the idea that, guess what? The law, the entirety of the Old Covenant, was nailed to the cross and therefore is no longer applicable. So how then do you go to Ezekiel and talk about what's going to happen in the future in fulfillment of Ezekiel? On the one hand, you have Ezekiel, part of the old law, part of the old law that was completely nailed to the cross. And on the other hand, you're appealing to Ezekiel for a future eschatology. I'm sorry, that's contradictory. But uh, that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Today, I want to focus on 2 Peter chapter 3, our second video examining uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, because Mr. Pope, and far as I know, virtually everyone, oh, there are a few exceptions, in the amillennial world, believes that 2 Peter chapter 3 is prediction of the yet future end of the world, end of time, the destruction of literal, physical, material, heaven and earth. Now, what is important for you to know, and please, take the time, go back and watch last week's video, okay, in which I pointed out that Peter said, this second epistle, brethren, I, I write, in both of which uh, to stir up your holy minds by way of remembrance that you, that you might remember the words of the apostles, the words of our Lord, and of the holy, holy prophets who have spoken before that in the last days scoffers will come. So, Peter, in his discourse on the last days, his discourse concerning the scoffers, concerning the day of the Lord, is repeating, number one, he is repeating what he said in his first epistle. Well, remember, he said in his first epistle that the day of the Lord was coming very soon. He said the appointed time, the divinely appointed time for the judgment had arrived. That means, I'll put it like this, 2 Peter chapter 3 is about the last day's day of the Lord, the time of the judgment of the ungodly, right? But 2 Peter chapter 3 is a reiteration of what Peter said in 1 Peter about the day of the Lord and the time of the judgment of, un, of the ungodly. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter said that the day of judgment had drawn near. Therefore, the day of judgment, the day of judgment of the ungodly of 2 Peter 3 had drawn near. The time had arrived. You see how powerful that is? And it's, un it's unavoidable. You have to be able to prove that Peter, number one, was not talking about the same, first Peter, was not talking about the same day of the Lord, second Peter chapter three, or you have to be able to prove that when Peter said the time for the judgment has arrived, he didn't really mean it. Didn't mean it at all. When he said the end of all things has drawn near, he didn't really mean that. And when he said that Christ was, quote, ready to judge the living and the dead, unquote, he didn't really mean that. You see, we have to turn Peter's language upside down. Or we have to determine, Mr. Pope would have to prove, that Peter was talking about a different day of the Lord in 1 Peter, pardon me, from what he was talking about in 2 Peter. But wait, he said in 2 Peter chapter 3 that he was only reminding them what he said in the first epistle. So you can't prove that. So, this morning, 
And again, this is video number 13. I want to focus on the fact that in 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to break this down very, very simply. Peter was predicting the last days. The last days, day of the Lord. Number three, the last days, day of the Lord for the destruction of creation. See, we can break it down that simply. Point number one, and here's where it gets extremely tenuous and troublesome for Mr. Pope and all of those in that fellowship. Well, for anyone at all that tries to take 2 Peter chapter 3 as predictive of the future. And here's what I mean. You have to understand in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 when Peter says, I'm only reminding you of what the holy, holy prophets who have written before, who have spoken before, said that in the last days scoffers shall come. There are two points I want to make here. Point number one, Mr. Pope identifies the last days in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 as the Christian age. Okay. Point number two, Mr. Pope does not believe that there are any signs of the day of the Lord that would consummate the Christian age. And yet Peter says, knowing this first, that the Old Testament prophets foretold the coming of scoffers in the last days who would deny the coming of the Lord. Well, aren't those scoffers signs of the day of the Lord? Now, I assume that Mr. Pope would say, well, no, 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 uh, you're misapplying that. It says that in the last days, that means in the duration of the last days, all the time, all the while, that the last days are going on, they've been going on for 2,000 years, there have always been scoffers denying the coming of the Lord. Well, I suppose a person might possibly, sort of, kind of, maybe, make that application. It does say, in the last days. And it doesn't say, in the last of the last days. So let's, let's set that aside as a, quote, granting for argument's sake. But here's the real question. When Mr. Pope says that 2 Peter chapter 3 He's talking about the last days as the Christian age. He is completely overlooking, perhaps ignoring, the Old Testament definition as well as the new of the last days. Listen, I was raised believing, teaching, even debating that the last days was a technical expression to speak of the entirety of the Christian age. And the last day supposedly began on Pentecost. After all, Peter stood up when the Holy Spirit had been poured out. The, the apostles were accused of being drunk. Peter stands up with the eleven and says, Men and brethren, let me speak, freely speak to you. These men are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour up my spirit upon all flesh. Well, here we have it, we are told. I believed, I taught. The days, or the day of Pentecost, was the beginning of the last days in which the Holy Spirit would be poured out. Well, here's a problem for Mr. Pope and his view. If he argues on 2 Peter chapter 3 that scoffers would be during the entirety of the Christian age, i.e., the last days, then why would he not grant that, guess what? It shall come to pass in the last days, I will pour up my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams. If the scoffers were to be present for the duration of the last days, then why wouldn't the gifts be present for the duration of the last days, since it says it shall come to pass in the last days, same identical terminology as found in 2 Peter chapter 3. It is therefore totally inconsistent for Mr. Pope to say, well, the scoffers would be present for 2,000 years and turn around and say the gifts ended in the first century. See, that's, uh, and catch the power of this. Peter said, citing Joel, Joel, 
that those gifts would be signs in heaven above, earth beneath, before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. What were, the, what were those signs or what were those miracles? They were signs of the day of the Lord. Here's the day of the Lord for which there are signs, and yet Mr. Pope says there are no signs of the day of the Lord. Now, Peter is writing during that very identical period of time of the miraculous gifts. When, when the miraculous gifts were fully functional in the church, and what were those gifts pointing forward to? The day of the Lord. Is that a different day of the Lord from 2 Peter chapter 3? If those gifts were fully functional when Peter was written, Mr. Pope would agree that they were, and if they were signs of the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, then how does Peter hopscotch over that imminent day of the Lord, you know, the one that he said had come, the time for that day of the Lord had come? How does Peter hopscotch over that to start talking about another different Day of the Lord at the ostensible so-called end of the world. You see, it doesn't make any textual or contextual or exegetical sense, but I must move on. So, Mr. Pope identifies the last days of 2 Peter chapter 3 as the Christian age. He identifies the day of the Lord of 2 Peter chapter 3 as the end of time. He identifies the day of the Lord to destroy the earth and the elements that are therein as the end of time. Well, let's see something here. Remember, Peter said that he was reminding his audience of what the Old Testament prophets had written about the day of the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. In verse 2, it says, It shall come to pass in the last days or the latter days, it's the same, in the Septuagint, it's the same identical Greek term as found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Same identical Greek term. It shall come to pass in the, in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established and the tops of the mountains shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow into it. And many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, here we have the last days. What would happen in the last days? The Messianic temple would be established. Now, here's something you've absolutely got to understand. Jesus was the rejected cornerstone of that temple, but Jesus appeared before Pentecost, didn't he? The apostles and prophets, New Testament apostles and prophets, were the foundation of that temple, and they existed prior to Pentecost. Now, was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the energizing of the church, the temple of God? Yes, it doesn't deny that the church was, quote, under construction prior to Pentecost. But that means that the church was in existence, even if in nascent form, in the last days before Pentecost. In other words, the last days existed before Pentecost. And that alone destroys Mr. Pope's theology of 2 Peter chapter 3. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if 2 Peter chapter 3 is talking about the last days that existed prior to Pentecost, or if 2 Peter 3 is not talking about the last days as the Christian age, if he is talking about the last days, in fact, of Old Covenant Israel, Mr. Pope's eschatology goes up in smoke. Now, let's look at this. Mr. Pope applies Isaiah chapter 2, 2 through 4, what? To the establishment of the church on Pentecost, just as he applies Pentecost to the establishment of the last days. Well, let's see if that will work. It is interesting that in my upbringing in the Churches of Christ on Millennial World, fifth generation member, 
Second Peter, excuse me, Isaiah 2 through 4 were never seen, never exegeted, never presented as a united discourse, a singular prophecy concerning the last days. Oh, listen, preacher after preacher after preacher get up and expound on Isaiah 2, 2 through 3, or even 2 through 4. But the rest of the prophecy of Isaiah chapters 2 through 4 was literally absolutely ignored. And that's a fatal omission. Why? Well, it is fatal because I'm going to start with verse 5. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's the light of the Lord coming out of this house of the Lord of verses 2 and following. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines. They are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, etc., etc. And I, for time, i got to skip down to verse 10. Enter into the rock. Hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be down bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted, quote, in that day. What day? The day of the terror of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, wait a minute. Enter into the rock, hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His presence, of His majesty. We continue. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything, proud and lofty. Now, i got to skip down. Verse 19. Once again, they shall go into the holes of the rocks, into the caves of the earth, from the terror of the Lord, from the glory of His majesty. Now watch this. When He arises to shake the earth mightily. Now, point number one. This language of entering into the rocks, hiding in the caves, is the language taken directly from a time of warfare. In Judges 6 and in Judges 8, in the story of Gideon, in his defeat of the Midianites, of Zeba and Zalmunna, guess what? When the children of Israel heard that the Midianites were stirred up against them, the inhabitants of Israel did what? They ran to the mountains, they hid in the rocks and in the caves. See, typical language. That's what people did in the ancient times when an army was about to invade and destroy their country. They ran to the hills. Oh, wait a minute. This is talking about the day of the Lord. The day of... Pardon me. The day of the Lord when men could run to the hills, hide in the caves. Now, let me ask you a question. In this proposed end of time day of the Lord, would it be possible for men to run to the hills and hide in the caves? No, because the view in the all-millennial, post-millennial world is that the day of the Lord at the so-called end of time is over Boom, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you don't have time to go anywhere. As John A.T. Robinson said years ago in a little book he produced, the exhortation to flee to the mountains and hide in the rocks and the caves hardly comports well with the event, with an event that is over in a flash, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So here's, watch this, here is the last days Day of the Lord. Now remember this terminology of in, in that day, of back here in chapter 2 and verse 11. You see, this term, in that day, is used throughout, throughout Isaiah 2 through 4 to link the entire prophecy together as a singular prophecy. Now, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, let me go on in verse 21. Go in, they, well, verse 20 again. In that day. What day is this? The day of the Lord. In that day. What day is this? It's the last days. In that day, they will go into the clefts of the rocks, into the crags of the rugged rocks, from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. Watch this. When He arises to shake 
the earth mightily. So what do we have? In Isaiah chapter 2, I don't have time to go all the way through to chapter 4. But in Isaiah chapter 2, we have the last days. We have the last days day of the Lord. Now, listen to me very, very carefully. Remember that Mr. Pope believes that God was through with Israel at the cross. Okay? Yet here we have a prophecy of the last days, day of the Lord, and it's against Israel. How do I know that? Well, because chapter 3, 4, which connects it to the previous discussion. Behold, the Lord, of the, the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty men and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, the counselor and the skillful artisan, and the expert enchanter. In that day, a man will protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills, uh, ills those who, uh, uh, who cry out to one another, give us bread, give us bread, give us bread, because it's a time of famine. What else is it? Verse 18, or 13, excuse me. The Lord will stand up to plead with His people, stands to judge His people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of His people, with its princes. For you, that's the elders of the people, you have eaten up my Vineyard, the Lord says. What, it, what was the vineyard of the Lord when this was written? Read Isaiah chapter 5. It was Israel. This is a judgment on Israel. In the last days, at the day of the Lord. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this completely blows Mr. Pope's de definition of the last days completely out of the water. It blows his definition of the last days, day of the Lord, as an earth-burning, time-ending event out of the water. Because Isaiah 2 is about the last days. It's about the last days day of the Lord. And it's about the last days day of the Lord when the Lord would come and shake the earth mightily. But it's when men would run to the hills, hide in the rocks and the caves. Now then, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm basically out of time. Uh, but I want you to remember, I, I discuss all of this in this book, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat. It's the only full preterist commentary on 2 Peter chapter 3 that I'm aware of, and I discuss what I'm sharing with you here in even greater detail. Now, remember, remember this. Isaiah chapter 2 through 4, the last days, the last days, day of the Lord, the last days, day of the Lord, when the Lord would arise to shake the earth mightily, when men would run to the hills and cry to the rocks, fall on us. Well, in, uh, in Luke 23, 28 and following, Jesus was being led out to his crucifixion. The, the women of Jerusalem gathered around and they were weeping, they were crying, they were lamenting. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 28, Jesus turns to the women the best that he can and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and the breasts which never nursed, then, 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 they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and the hills cover us. Uh-oh, what's he doing? He is citing Isaiah chapter 2. But wait, ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah chapter 2 is about the last days, day of the Lord, when the Lord would rise to shake the earth mightily, when men would run to the hills and hide in the rocks and in the caves. But wait a minute. Jesus applies this to a time future to him that is obviously after the day of Pentecost. But that means that Jesus is applying the last days, day of the Lord prophecy, to a time after the cross, which means 
he is applying a prophecy about Israel to a time 40 years after the cross. Now, once again, got to close. If it's true that 2 Peter chapter 3 is about the last days, the day of the Lord, to destroy heaven and earth, if it's the case that it's the same prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2, and Isaiah chapter 2 is about the last days, it's about the, the day of the Lord, and it's about the day of the Lord when the Lord would shake the earth mightily. Well, listen, according to Hebrews chapter 12, 25 to 28, when the Lord would shake something, He would remove it. In other words, He'd destroy it. So Isaiah chapter 2 really is about the destruction of heaven and earth. So, unless Mr. Pope can prove that 2 Peter chapter 3 is about a different last day's day of the Lord to destroy heaven and earth from that in Isaiah chapter 2. And since Isaiah chapter 2 is about the last day's judgment of Israel, oh, and by the way, in chapter 4, it's about the last day's judgment of Israel for shedding innocent blood, which occurred in AD 70. But again, Unless Mr. Pope can completely, totally separate and divorce these two days of the Lord and create two different last days, two different days of the Lord, two different destructions of creation in the last days, then guess what? Jesus' application of Isaiah chapter 2, and oh, by the way, uh, Jesus, uh, Isaiah 2 and Hosea 8.10 are parallel passages. They're both about the last days. And finally, finally, I only have a moment. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in predicting the coming of the Lord in flaming fire to take vengeance on those that do not know God, that do not obey His commandments, quotes verbatim in the Septuagint from Isaiah chapter 2. Paul was predicting the day of the Lord in judgment of Israel for persecuting the Thessalonians and the Christians in the first century. And he said the Lord was going to come in flaming fire in judgment of those persecutors to give those Christian saints relief when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. And he said it would be in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, Isaiah 2, 19 to 21. That means that Mr. Pope's appeal to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 as a yet future judgment is also false and falsified. I think you can see, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Pope's theology based on 2 Peter chapter 3 is completely, totally false. Once again, he has to create two last days periods. He has to create two days of the Lord. He has to create two Last days, days of the Lord for the destruction of creation. He has to divorce 2 Peter 3 from Isaiah. And yet Isaiah is clearly predicting what Peter predicted. Okay, don't forget my book, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat, in which I discuss all of this and much, much more. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, Go to the bookstore, order, order the book, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat. Be sure to send me a note saying you saw the offer on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll refund your shipping. That will save you $5. Listen, you have a fantastic weekend. God bless. I'll see you on Monday.